the disc thing. School committee, as is our custom, and I invite you to stand and salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, first, we move to approving um, our uh, agenda for the evening. Um, all right. A uh, couple quick minor additions. Under the superintendent's report, um, the superintendent's going to give us an update on the first grade assignment planning, but we're not going to have the data presentation tonight as it's not complete yet. Um, so we have to the, make that note. Um, and in the policy subcommittee section, we're removing the policy on social networking. It's agenda that has come up at a, a further meeting. Um, Sheridan. I'd li like to give that an update on the 350th, please. Good enough. I'll put it at the beginning of my report. Okay. Yep. I got that. That's all right. Oh, excuse me. Okay. And, yes. And on, we have an informational item under your chairman's report uh, on the uh, local 1395 contract. I'd like to request that that uh, be a vote. <coughs> I can explain why that is the case. We can, we can, we can take it at that point. I think Great. that's fine. Anything else for uh, amendments to our agenda for the evening? All right, hearing none, we'll move the agenda forward and we will start with citizen speak. Um, do we have a list of, oh, is there anyone on it more? <laughs> okay. As there's no one on the list for citizen speak, we'll move on to the approval of minutes of the April 19th uh, school committee meeting. That was a finance subcommittee that was posted also as a full school committee meeting, um, and we have a set of minutes for it. So moved. It's moved by Ms. Sheridan, second by Mr. Walker. Any additions, uh, corrections, amendments to the minutes of the 19th, April 19th? Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the minutes of April 19th? Opposed, abstaining, one abstention, Ms. Bagley Jones. So that passes. Um, next, uh, the superintendent's report. Ms. Gormley. Thank you, Chairman Pavlicek. We're going to begin with our first grade assignment uh, planning, and I'm going to have Mr. Phelan, Assistant Superintendent Phelan, begin to speak to uh, the data and the status of uh, your requests and how we're going to proceed. Mr. Phelan. Thank you, Superintendent Gorm. We, um At the last school committee meeting, we did make a presentation on student assignment uh, for grade one. Uh, the school committee did request data to be presented. Uh, given the complexity of gathering state data and putting it into our unique school systems programming uh, through the French Immersion and English program uh, lens, uh, it, it does take some time to provide that data and put it in a proper context so we can have uh, the data inform the conversation that we would like to have around student assignment. Uh, that will take some time and we hope to have that prepared for our June 20th uh, meeting. And so uh, in the planning and in the discussions, a follow-up to uh, the presentation we had at the last meeting and that PowerPoint is on our website. Uh, we've had internal discussions. We've been meeting with our leadership team, and I have uh, two issues that I want to discuss with the school committee. One, uh, one of the goals of talking about capping French immersion, uh, one of the issues that's arisen is the single strand in English. And we have a single strand going forward at the Cunningham School. And our plan was to uh, have that single strand 
with the two English first grades at the Collicott um, heterogeneously integrate those three classes. And we've heard from Cunningham families who, um, again, they're two independent schools. They might share facilities, but they have their own principles, their own identities, the strength of this town, um, their schools and their school communities. And so um, working with the leadership team and hearing parents, um, I'd like to discuss with the school committee the possibility I brought this up at finance subcommittee and we decided to move it to full school committee. If I were to uh, send out a letter uh, to the parents of students in the French immersion uh, program at the Collicott Cunningham and the English, um, the students in the English program at the Collicott and then speaking with parents, um, they suggested expanding that to uh, the auxiliary class at the Glover in French immersion. And again, not committing that we would create a second strand of English at the Cunningham, but presenting the possibility if we ever were to open and um, we had enough students to open a second strand at the Cunningham, would uh, parents in the French immersion find that class size um, appealing for their child, uh, instructional match for their children? Um, did parents select the French immersion because um, they knew there might only be one strand at the Cunningham? Uh, are parents who are in the auxiliary class at the Glover who are Cunningham parents, would they choose to come back to the Cunningham? Again, this is, this is an issue for parents and it's an educational issue for the system. Um, so I presented this idea to Finance Subcommittee. And of course, uh, we meet every Monday morning. Uh, Chairman, uh, Finance Subcommittee Chairman Mary Kelly, Leroy Walker, and it's always a matter of finance. And so we do have, we're scheduled next year to have two co-taught uh, kindergartens. And you understand in the co-taught model, there are two teachers, a regular ed teacher and a special ed teacher. Um, we made no decisions, but I said, um, of course, somebody would say, where is that funding going to come from? And we do have that special ed teacher that at this time hasn't been placed. It's the only teacher in the Milton Public Schools who hasn't been assigned. And um, that would be a possibility. We made no decisions. I made no <laughs> proposal. And I said, if I sent this letter out, and I've drafted a letter that I can give you tonight, have send it to you via email, um, have you get your edits back to me. If we sent this letter out, I want it very clear that this isn't a certainty. This is, if you're interested, you can call me, you can email, I'll meet you at any time. Uh, you can meet with the uh, kindergarten teachers, the principals, and um, I would also offer uh, to set up a meeting if any parents or guardians wanted to come. So again, um, we would have to see what the response was to the letter. The class might not be able, um, we might not be able to have the enrollment we need uh, to um, create that classroom. But again, responding uh, to parents and um, the concerns that they have uh, in the spirit of uh, communication, it might be um, a valuable source of information to put that letter out and see what kind of response. But again, the message would have to be very clear that this is not a certainty and um, we would stay in close contact with any parents or guardians who might be interested. So I wanted to put that idea out to the full school committee. Um, again, discussion around it, the pros, the cons, and the possibility of uh, putting that letter out. And again, the core issue is um, that one strand of English at the Cunningham School. Ms. Pegley Jones. Uh, just a question. Mary, when you say the COTOT has two teachers in kindergarten, so you take one of those two teachers? That, I'm good, confused. It, that's a good point. And I should have made myself clearer. Um, we have a COTOT strand running at the Tucker and a COTOT strand running at the Glover. Okay. We have one grade that's um, out of um, school and it's at the Collicott, but that's because all the children uh, lived in the Collicott district. Well, we budgeted last year for a COTOT at the Tucker kindergarten and a COTOT at the Glover kindergarten, and those are the numbers that have been filling those programs. Well, moving up from our preschool, we only have um, children with IEPs 
that are, have been assigned to a co-top model to begin the program at the Glover. So right now there is no co-taught classroom scheduled to begin at kindergarten at the Tucker. So um, we scheduled, we budgeted for um, a regular ed teacher and a kindergarten teacher in one of the kindergartens at Glover and a regular ed and a kindergarten teacher at the Tucker. So now we have one teacher um, that hasn't been assigned to a classroom. Got it. Thank and you. as I said, in the um, home Milton Public Schools, the high school schedule is being done. Um, we're actually uh, working on uh, those numbers now. Uh, and, you know, every class is um, looking and fully enrolled. The peer school will begin their scheduling process. So when somebody, you know, again, and it would be a correct answer to ask, where would that um, classroom teacher come from? And how could you budget that classroom teacher? And again, somebody would ask, jumping ahead, um, the way the co-taught program has um, again serviced and thrived and progressed is that sometimes students are diagnosed um, later in their elementary career. Children have moved in to the Milton Public Schools with an IEP that requires a co-taught classroom. And again, I bring you back to the discussion we had at the last meeting. Um, Mr. Phelan, seven years ago, those students well might have gone to an out of district placement, mm -hmm. but we have um, a very effective model uh, that is thriving in um, our elementary schools. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Walker. So I think um, the letter is certainly one aspect of um, what should be our plan. I think the idea of asking uh, Collicott parents if they might voluntarily be interested in a single strand uh, in a second strand of English at uh, the Cunningham is not a bad idea. As, as I, uh, last meeting I said I wanted to hear from parents and I'm pleased to say that I did, both in person and by email. Uh, and I think we all appreciate that this is an issue that has uh, a number of different aspects. It, it involves the co-taught classrooms, it involves uh, English enrollment, and it involves uh, the demand for French and also class size in, in French. So I think ultimately we're going to need a solution that addresses all of those things. I think the, the idea about uh, this is a good idea for how we might address the issue of the single strand at the Cunningham. We have uh, the Glover that has some issues as well uh, that, that we need to pay attention to. So I'm hopeful that um, we can come up with a Solomon-like solution that will address all of those things in some way. Ms. Sharon. So Ms. Gormley, what would the timeline be for this in terms of the letter going out and you're saying, you're being very clear that this is not a done deal, you're just getting feedback. It's like well, a survey basically. Correct? A letter I drafted um, that if you edited tomorrow um, could go out Thursday morning email and what we did the last time we communicated and we reached, we were able to reach every um, parent, we then double back with U.S. mail. And so what I asked was by next Wednesday, the 13th, I gave uh, parents and guardians till Wednesday the 13th, and um, then I would communicate uh, with the parents. Next, again, I would communicate with you if you um, wanted to go forward with this, and um, then we would communicate with families and guardians if we weren't successful, and again, uh, we do a lot of work, and um, as Mr. Phelan brings up at meetings, uh, districts across the state work to equalize um, class size at the first grade. Um, we have concrete examples in neighboring communities. I would communicate with families whether this idea was successful or if we weren't able to have uh, enough volunteers or transfers, the idea was not successful. And hopefully when you read and edit the letter, um, you would, the message would be clear. So I've given parents till um, Wednesday, June 13th, but I'm uh, open to edits and suggestions. So, so the idea is that parents would know, say by the end of June, whether or not this was actually going to take effect. I think it's important, you know, to, if we're talking about making those kind of changes that it be done before people go away for the summer. Any other comments from Mary? 
Just see, I think one of the other aspects of this that we discussed at the finance subcommittee meeting was um, knowing that there, are, there will continue to be incoming first graders um, that want to enroll and whether uh, we should entertain for this year only putting a cap on the French immersion classes um, with the intent of doing more review of the data and coming up with a more concrete plan going forward. But, you know, certainly at the Collicott, there's no room for anyone. And, you know, whether 26 is the appropriate <coughs> size is a whole other story. So there's really almost two tracks to be considered here. One, would parents opt for going to a smaller class size and English have given the opportunity? The other being just, you know, prospectively for new coming families you know, do we say that the French immersion program is closed? Well, that was my second agenda item. Sorry. Excellent. No, I'd rather it brought up by you than for me to bring it up. So that was my second agenda item. Again, to brainstorm with the school committee and to discuss tonight is just that from uh, the leadership team and uh, central office looking to, uh, to Ms. Kelly's point. Um, we have held approximately Ms. Kelly are there two in English and three in French. And we have, uh, John Phelan eloquently says, uh, in the pipeline, we have people who have taken out um, the packets who are in different, um, different stages of registration, whether we look at a date, whether we look at everyone who has a folder out now, contact them to get their materials back in. And uh, to elaborate on Ms. Kelly's point, um, over the past summers, Mr. Phelan uh, can speak better to this than I can. Uh, when people enroll all through July and August, right up to Labor Day, they enter into either program. So with the percentage of students enrolling in French immersion this year, um, again, um, being the devil's advocate and presenting both sides of the story to you, uh, Ms. Barrett and Mr. Walsh, who take the calls from the public, um, you know, they haven't been directed um, until recently, they have started to explain to people when they call on the phone asking about moving to the Milton Public Schools. Um, they, you know, they would have prior to these discussions uh, said that it was open enrollment, but they have shared with the public that there are discussions at the um, school committee level. So I would look to ask you um, to, in addition to uh, discussing this letter, uh, whether it's a date uh, to charge us with uh, taking and going after all of the folders, completing all the work of the individuals that have begun the registration packet, and then um, stop the registration in French immersion for the month of July and August. Mr. Phelan, could you speak to registration, what the past trends have been? Sure. We, we have um, benefited by um, having support uh, in the central office to get all of our kindergarten students enrolled rather quickly this year. So we think that we have a high percentage of our students enrolled for the fall. But each year we have a number of families that um, enroll their children at all of our 13 grades, uh, kindergarten through 12, through the months of July and August. Um, and in fairness to uh, all of our families who would like to come to the Milton Public Schools, uh, uh, it would be helpful for us to, uh, to set a timeline. Uh, we will be looking at any family who has already completed a packet uh, in honor of our current enrollment system for them to enter into either program. Uh, we would look at any families that we have been communicating with uh, who we have uh, informed that we do obviously have two programs at the elementary level if they were inquiring about choosing that at the first grade. Um, and then we would most likely set a date by which we would say uh, that the program is at its capacity and we were unable to um, enroll anybody else for the fall of 2012. Uh, in the program, given the current circumstances of our grade one assignment. Ms. Bagley Jones. I just have a couple of questions, mm -hmm. so I'll just ask them and then you can answer them. I'd like to know, do we have a sense of the number in the pipeline? Mm -hmm. um, the last couple of summers, how many new kids have we typically had enter? I mean, is it two, is it 25, is it, you know, I mean, and I know that's not a guarantee, but what's it typically look like the last couple of years? And then, um, how many slots are left in the French immersion? I thought we were done already. Well, if I could start backwards, those are excellent questions. First, remember the letter that I gave you that I sent out um, 
really reiterating many aspects of the French Immersion Program and um, seven parents responded to that letter and moved from French to English. And so if we keep in this cycle and we um, people volunteer and we create another classroom and people continue to register, then we're backfilling those seats. So it's been continual. I believe right now, Mr. Phelan, yesterday we counted with Finance Subcommittee, did we have nine or eight or nine seats? We, we, we were at almost maximum prior to the folks um, changing uh, their minds and we were probably about eight seats there may be eight seats available throughout the district with the two auxiliary classes in place but to miss Kelly's point um, that's going to the 26 and you know if we didn't if we we if our goal was to have lower class size um, that would be fine so and um, a sense of over the summer I would it, that's an interesting question because when you think of um, we uh, in our recent memory in the last two years filling the classrooms uh, my recent memory is perhaps three or four students three or four you know I, I would I wouldn't think that was 10 or 15 okay. but we're really um, we're really at the will of who buys a home and their children but if patents I, I could tell you certainly it's not 10 or 15 people who will move in and do we have a sense of how many packets are out there Mr. Phelan uh, we know we have three done that are in the uh, central office awaiting uh, placement and I believe we have three or four uh, families that we have been communicating with who have taken folders out at this time uh, that that do have uh, an expectation of being able to enroll in either program but um, can I follow up on that so that could be six or seven families that could enroll in either French or English so they could take the eight seats so so what we are open correct so we're trying to plan for that capacity right now by hopefully drawing a uh, timeline that uh, will give us the capacity to uh, enroll those families as as we have had um, publicized on the web and has been our enrollment process but we anticipate that being at a maximum with those current folders so we would like to uh, have the committee understand and the public understand that we may need to say that we are full uh, prior to that happening do we answer your questions yes mm -hmm. Ms. Kelly so I just wanted to follow up on something that Superintendent Gormley said where she said you said um, three students um, over the summer but that's three students only for first grade Correct. right okay. Okay. so we yes. get many students yes. over the right. summer who are entering Thank the you. school system it's just we're just yes. talking about first grade and to your point Miss Kelly you. that's uh, French immersion right oh I thought you meant oh. three total yeah. no that would be in French just in the French immersion first grade mm. it, and so the other question I had is um, this is calling for eight classes of French French immersion which is greater than I, I, I don't have a chart of what we have this year or previous years um, but certainly compared to the World Study Committee I think we had seven classes in the that presentation from last week if anyone has I should have brought copies with me is that, uh, is we that have that chatted out in last week mr. Phelan has it right here do we is this Right. So, so in the proposed um, classes for next year, there are eight French immersion. What I'm trying to get a gauge of is, is that one second. more class that yes. we typically have been having? Yes. Okay. And so there has been some discussion about cost. When we add an additional French immersion class, not only are we hiring a new teacher, which I think we ha you have stated in some of your um, concerns about this, that identifying French immersion teachers that are qualified to teach right. in, in this strand you know may present issues um, but certainly if I know if I'm going for a job and I know I'm the only one who qualifies my negotiation strategy may be a little bit stronger in terms of where I come in on at level so I just want to put that we, we don't negotiate because it's the union mm -hmm. and so there are no negotiate that's a really good question that people have asked me over the years when people are hired um, they have to document full year teaching experience from the district they're coming from and they have to document their degree level so there are but it's a good question people have asked it over the years there are no negotiations this is a union and so every um, you know again everybody's treated um, the same there there are no um, <coughs> recruiting uh, well again recruiting we go out and recruit but um, 
there are no incentives. But we recruit people that are proficient in French. Absolutely. Right. Um, so that's one component of it. But the other is we have to buy materials and supplies for an Absolutely. additional French immersion program, which does have a cost. Yes. So these are all things that need to be considered as we're weighing how this process moves forward. Absolutely. Can I ask, ask a question? Yes, back when we have to buy new materials for another English classroom? No, because that would have been an English classroom. Yes. Oh, oh, I see. But if we added a second strand, don't we have to create, well, if we create a new English classroom, we need new English materials. I have materials. those materials. Oh, do. Oh. Because um, that um, second auxiliary would have been an English classroom. I see. So, Ms. Kelly, do you have a motion? Before, can I just ask a question? Do we sure. have this? I don't see it in my packet. Does anybody else have it? Excuse me? Do we have this? Um, let me see. Hold on just a second. That might have been from yeah, the finance sub. Been from finance 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 sub so I have an extra yeah. copy. Okay, thank you. I just I hadn't seen it. Can I? Uh, Go ahead. Okay, so you were asking about the deadline for the French immersion. I'm and asking I, two things. Yep. One, sending out the letter. Yep. Again, with no commitment. Um, we'll see what the response is. And the letter, the response to the first letter was positive. And the second thing that I'm asking is uh, to determine a date that, again, with the enrollment that we've seen this year, um, to close uh, to any new students moving in over the summer. Even though we still have eight slots technically open in French, why would we close the we, French enrollment? Because, because given the amount of packets that we have full passed in right now, which is three, in the three to four, that's an estimate of who we are talking to and are currently filling out forms with the expectation. We assume that we'll be at capacity after we allow that, quote, pipeline group of folks who have already interacted with the district. We would want to honor their desire of choice. So we believe that we'll be at capacity after we draw that line at a certain point. So what we, our goal is to draw a line at the point where we will not have to add anybody more to the program, any additional students to the program that would put us over potentially the 26 per class. So we're trying to come up with mm -hmm. what that timeline would look like. Mm -hmm. It might not be mm -hmm. perfect. There might be 125 out there or 124 out there, but we are anticipating to be a capacity mm -hmm. and therefore want to be very clear and transparent with any new families mm -hmm. coming in that they would not be able to enroll because we will be at capacity by the time we speak with them. We don't want to have mm -hmm. to do it retroactively. Mm -hmm. And if I might, just to Miss Kelly's question, it's a really good question, and we've spent a long time on it. Let's say this letter goes out and we're successful, and uh, people uh, see a second strand, they see low class size in first grade. We don't want this continual all summer. Well, we created this classroom, and then more people move in. And so this could, again, there's something to be said for consistency, to be able to, um, one, one, I think Ms. Sheridan said, when will people know? So decisions have to be made. So again, as Mr. Phelan said, we have these seats. Everyone who have made a commitment to, we've given this a lot of discussion. Who have we spoken to on the phone? Who's, who's, who's um, taken out a packet? Uh, in the process. Mr. Walker. I, I still am a little confused, so let me get this straight. So we have eight open seats in the French Immersion Program. We have six to seven families that are still, they're in the pipeline, but we don't know which program they're going to exactly. choose. Six no, I'm sorry. We know that they're going to choose, we know that they want to choose French. Oh, all of them. Correct. Three who definitely want French and the three to four who have been interacting with Sean Walsh and Jane Barrett, getting their materials together, stating that they would like to enroll in the French program. Okay, so your best bet is that? We have about seven families out there, and I don't want to say definite, but there could be one or two more, so I want to leave the district a right. little leeway just in case we missed a family that may have called right. and interfaced with one of our uh, school personnel regarding it. Okay. So this is basically to provide mm -hmm. us with a little buffer mm -hmm. so we, we know that mm -hmm. we're at capacity and we do not um, turn a family away mm -hmm. with whom we've already had a conversation yep. to, to let them enroll. Yep. And I don't mean to go back and forth. Can you just bear with me for a minute? The, the reason why is I thought you were saying, let's close French Immersion now, even though we have X amount of slots open. And I'm hearing you say, we don't plan to have any slots open. So once we know we don't, we're going to close it. 
Well, in the right? spirit of yeah. full disclosure, Thank you. I, I want to explain something to you. Um, and again, uh, this is, this is, these are somebody's children and it's very involved. I want to explain to you though, let's say we take care of everyone who has a packet out mm -hmm. and we send out this letter. And some people, choose, some parents or guardians choose to leave the French immersion and put their children in this second strand of English. My recommendation would not be for you to go all summer and new people who move in and I start filling up the French immersion again to 26. We have to be able to count on um, and go forward and be able to um, run the district, operate the district, and have numbers that we can count on. So I'm asking you that, that as of, um, again, be it the last day of school, July 1st, that we're able to look at who we have registered and be able to um, make decisions about um, next year. And, to, and again, it will be simultaneously to deciding if we're going to make this additional first grade at the Cunningham. So I want to tell you some, you know, I don't want to sit and look at you and um, have you say mid-July, well, you told me that, you know, everyone could keep getting into French. Well, what if, um, again, 10 people respond to this letter and leave the French and then would 10 new people who move into the district, you know, but my example to you was from my experience, that number wouldn't be 10. It's never been in my recent memory 10. But other people have something to say? Because I have something else to say, but I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Walker, you have. All right, let me, I'm going to try to focus the discussion and make a motion. And then we can have discussion on the motion. My motion is that except for parents who have began begun the enrollment process, that would be defined as parents who have had a conversation with our staff expressing interest in French immersion or, or are further along in the process, except for those parents and children that we close for this year only, for the 2012-2013 school year, um, enrollment for French immersion at this time. Second. Second, seconded by Ms. Kelly. Now, discussion on that. That's the, Ms. Bagley Jones. I guess I would want to see a minimum in the enrollment before it's closed because we, let's say, 20 kids pull out. So we're 20 down, and then we're looking at smaller class sizes, which we would all agree would be great. Right. But the reason we have larger class French sizes in grade one is because we know historically kids drop out as they continue in the program. So if we start at 22 in grade one French, we will be less than 22 by grade three. So and that's historically been true. I don't want to see 26 kids in a classroom. Neither do but I. But that's the whole point of we don't want to see 17 kids in a classroom either in grade four. Well, we can't afford it. So here's my thinking on that. We, we know right now that the demand for French immersion is higher than we thought it would be. We didn't really anticipate this, but we're going to accommodate every single parent and child in the system who has said they want French immersion. So I don't, I don't want to do anything to exacerbate that problem. It could be the case if we send out this letter and we have a better than anticipated response, I'm not betting on that, but it could happen, that we might be, we might be having a very different discussion and have a very different problem. But that would be a good problem to have because then we could talk about what the optimum class size is in French immersion. That would be great. But I don't think we're going to have that problem. But I think for right now, with what we know now, this is the right action to take. Ms. Kelly. Um, I believe a, a similar letter was sent out by Ms. Gormley that did create movement. It did. What, the numbers that we have now on this sheet are reflective Reflect of that movement. Right. So right now at Glover, there are three French immersion classes um, and one in a, a co-taught English and a regular English. The regular English has a class size of 14, and that's after an original letter. So there wasn't a lot of movement into that um, lower class size, which is essentially what we're offering again. Um, so I think I totally understand what you're referring to mm -hmm. in terms of um, concern about the, the equity of class sizes as mm -hmm. it progresses through the elementary. But I think one of the dri driving forces here is not only 
um, it, it's the fact that there's so much interest in French that it really is affecting the English. Mm -hmm. exactly. and, um, and, and so part of this is, is really trying to address that issue as well. Michelle. So could you just, I think that you just spoke to this actually, Mrs. Kelly, but so the rationale for not allowing us to fill up those additional classes, should children move out of French into English, into this newly created class if it happens, you both, I'm hearing, were saying that you don't think it would be beneficial to just allow other people to fill up those classes to where they would have been. You want it to stay the same. Well, I, I'm in a little different place. I, I, we haven't, nothing, voting yes on this motion doesn't foreclose that possibility later on mm -hmm. in July, August, if that's the problem we have. But right now, that's not the situation we're facing. It's a very different situation, which is it looks like the program is essentially full right. and any further enrollments would exacerbate that. Right. I, I totally agree with that. We are at capacity. We have reached capacity and we need to do something about that. So, Ms. Gormley, I appreciate you bringing that forward to us and I think that that absolutely makes sense. I guess I would not, I would disagree slightly to say that we could change our mind in, in July or August and say, oh, we'll let a few more people back in and right. fill up those French classes. That would not work. So I think that we need to be very clear now um, what it is we want to do. Capping, yes, if, if that's what the committee agrees, and then whether or not to let um, those other remaining seats in French, should they open up, um, be filled with new coming people. Say something? You're right, Ms. Um, yeah, Ms. Bagley Jones, uh, uh, so Mr. Walker and Ms. Sheridan really just articulated it uh, clearer than I did for you. Right now, the individuals who have taken out the packets and the people we have in the pipeline um, will fill all the classes to 26. So this really is an issue. If those went beyond that number, mm -hmm. we'd all be coming together to talk about this. And so this is really sound planning today. You know, it's sound planning. It's bringing it to your attention. And... Uh, so that we, we get some guidance during the next two weeks on how to proceed. So we really have uh, two, two avenues going, two initiatives going, and again, this is constant work every single day, but I think that, um, to your point, for you to um, uh, be able to uh, see this right now, we'd be at all 26s without the letter being sent out. They w I would have to be asking you this now because they would all be at 26, all the French immersion would be at 26s with the pipeline and the enrollment numbers you have now. I see that you only have five seats left because you have two at Collicott for 26, they're full. Cunningham, you have one at 24, one at 25, Glover, two at 24, and Tucker, one at 25. So I see you can only add five more seats if you're keeping each class at 26. Yeah. So it's five, it's not eight seats, right? Unless they're going to go over 26, which I don't think I mean, anybody's talking well, about. Am I it's counting a, it wrong? Yes. Okay. Go with us. <laughs> Start with us at the beginning. Yep. Um, again, we asked them to date all of this, but we have, um, Ms. Jones, two, uh, the 20, two seats at the, call, at the Cunningham. Two seats? A seat 24, that would give us two Mr. seats. Mr. Chair, if, oh, right. if, if we're going to have extended discussion about this sheet, can we make sure all of us have it? Of course. Oh, did I count wrong? <laughs> um, I counted wrong. Didn't I? Well, in, in any case, I think the issue is that there are a very limited number of seats, and folks in the pipeline seem to be filling them at this point. Right. Yeah, I get it, and I've five seen it, but if we're going to talk yeah. at it, it's right. seven. Right. I'm sorry, right. I was wrong. Seven. So, the motion on the floor for Mr. Walker is that ab uh, except for people who are currently in the pipeline, as he defined it as having already spoken with someone in the enrollment office or have, or further along in the partially processed paperwork or whatever, people who are currently in the process of enrolling in French immersion, that uh, except for those people, we would uh, close enrollment for French immersion for next fall. So any other discussion we want to have on that particular motion, we'll take the motion of a separate letter to parents separately. Anything else? All right, well then hearing none, I'll call for a vote on that. All those in favor of the motion? Oh, it's unanimous, thank you very much. 
And now on the issue of the letter. Do we need a motion or no? I, I mean, the uh, superintendent is free to write letters as she chooses. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned. Right. Uh, yeah. I, no, we don't need a motion. I think, uh, I think asking for voluntary unless, unless there was motion some, in here and, and right. is within the program is certainly a why don't, why don't we say prerogative of the superintendent. With, with any edits from school committee sure. members. Ms. Kelly. I, I would just ask, in terms of the letter, it's being offered to all French immersion students? Because to me, um, I mean, I, I, I just think that makes sense. Yes, it, it is being offered to all. The only people it won't be offered to is the English at Tucker and Glover. The English, so, right, right. right. But so essentially it's, it's directed towards French immersion yep. students yes. saying there is an opportunity to get a lower class size English class. It will be housed at Cunningham. <coughs> and if you'd like to avail yourself yep. of that, let us know. Yes. Ms. Sharon. So uh, having not been at the Finance Subcommittee meeting, I'm sorry to ask this again, but at what point in time do you think that we'll know if there is funding available for that classroom? Or is that something that's still to be determined? Because I honestly feel like we shouldn't be sending out a letter if we don't know that there would be m uh, um, money available for that. We're offering them something we don't know if it's available. Well, I, maybe I, I haven't I addressed that at the beginning. Um, I, when we uh, discussed this at Finance Subcommittee, um, my proposal would be the teacher that we have having to not fill the two co-taught classrooms. Right. So when we go to Finance Subcommittee, if we ever make a proposal, Finance Subcommittee will say, uh, what are your proposals for funding for that initiative? You, you don't have the money. Um, what are you going to transfer within the budget? And so my proposal would be that cl that one person. I'm sorry, right. teacher. Right. The issue is that well, we budgeted for two co-tots. We only have enrollment for one. Right. We only knew that within the last four months. Okay. All right. I think we hear uh, consensus that. Thank you. Distribute the letter for edits and, and send it on. Thank you. Anything else in your report, Ms. Gordon? Briefly. Let's go right ahead. Uh, Let's move it along. All right. <laughs> uh, Mr. Phelan, do you want to uh, share with the public the Katzenet initiative? Sure. Uh, through our work with the Wellness Committee, uh, the Milton High School Athletic Director, and Todd Ducham, who is uh, 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 part of the CATS team. CATS is this uh, athletic training group that works out of Hingham and has been providing us with uh, recess activity and before school uh, activities for our students and working with our high school students. Uh, in partnering with CATS, we're going to offer all uh, Milton High School student athletes the ability to uh, get involved in a CATS class for a very much reduced rate here at the Milton High School Fieldhouse in Brooks Field. Uh, this usually has been a type of workout that our football team has provided with their coaches and we're hoping that all male and female student athletes preparing for the fall uh, sports season in the winter sports season can take advantage of the uh, plier metrics and weightlifting that not only will uh, you know advance their athletic uh, capacity, but also uh, to the discussion that we've had in wellness, really prevent a lot of injury. Um, so we look forward to that partnership. We appreciate Steve Traster and Todd Ducham doing that work. And the coaches have been given uh, the flyers, and we'll start to communicate that to all of our high school student athletes. We will open up that um, uh, camp, and uh, those they're going to come in three three-week sessions throughout the summer and we will be opening that to our eighth grade students who are rising up to the high school as well. So we're very happy to uh, create this opportunity for all of our student athletes at Milton High. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. Um, I want to announce to the public, I put out in my email blast that last Friday, we've appointed Dr. Karen Spaulding to the principalship of the PS Middle School. We had an outstanding screening committee, a strong pool of candidates. Um, we interviewed six individuals and I'm proud to tell you that yesterday, Mr. Phelan and I went to the PS school and uh, thanked Mr. Jett uh, in front of his staff, thanked Andy Bowles, our <coughs> vice principal who's going to a middle school in Attleboro, and uh, welcomed Dr. Karen Spaulding to the principalship of the Pierce school. 
Um, we have now initiated a screening committee. We're asking parents to contact the PTO presidents at the Cunningham School. Staff will contact Union President Margaret Gibbons. I'm asking for a school committee representative, and uh, we're going ahead uh, to fill the position of the principal of the Cunningham School. Um, the school committee uh, was well represented at all of the senior activities. I'm sure you join me. And uh, the first thing is that everyone's safe, and the second thing that everyone is happy. We had an unbelievable senior week here at Milton High School, culminated with really a phenomenal graduation ceremony. And um, I've gotten more positive responses and uh, how much pride people took. And uh, again, to look out at that audience, I don't know if there was a space left in that field house. Uh, for all of those families, extended families and friends to be able to share in that joy of that graduation. It was phenomenal. And special congratulations to Member Kelly and Bagley Jones, who um, were even more involved in that graduation ceremony than all of us. Uh, we have um, Ms. Bagley Jones, Ms. Um, Sheridan will report on the 350th. Uh, next Wednesday night, a reminder, we have our volunteer school committee initiated by Ms. Bagley Jones years ago, our volunteer reception. We're getting phenomenal uh, response from individuals who want to come and uh, we'll celebrate all the volunteer work. Our last day of school is next Friday, June 15th. And uh, we're going to put out an email blast and reminding parents uh, how their children can begin that very next day on the 16th, their summer reading programs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those will be in all of the offices, up on the web, and I would encourage uh, parents and guardians uh, to become involved in their child's uh, summer reading program. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to my report, just a couple of notes. First, before tonight's meeting, we did have a, our annual reception for retirees. And just to um, publicly announce the names of uh, Dr. Dr. Anthony Badacci, who's our uh, school uh, physician, has retired. Uh, Edward Burke, Jean Glynn, Nora Goonan, James Green, Michael McCormick, Mary Ellen McDermott, Eileen Narrett, Patricia Sampson, Ann Soar, and Martha Sherman. So we had quite a collection of people with an outstanding number of years of service to the Milton Schools uh, who have uh, retired as of this year. And as uh, the superintendent told them, uh, their positions will be filled, but they'll never be replaced. It was an amazing group of people. So that was earlier this evening. Um, we also, uh, at our last meeting, announced that uh, the Mass Association of School Committees had awarded uh, awards to the two um, ap uh, applications we put in for the friend of uh, friend of education for the Ada Rosemarin and for partners educational partners for the Copeland Family Foundation. We were going to try to hold that uh, ceremony tonight. Unfortunately, Ms. Rosemarin couldn't be here, so we will do it at our next school committee meeting. So that one will be coming up as well. Um, Ms. Sheridan would like to talk about the 350th. I'm, I'm so surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling the buzz all around town. Um, the stencils were placed on the roads on the parade route this, uh, this past week. The rain is held off today, so that was finished up. And have you seen the red, white, and blue lines down the middle of the parade route as well? There's just a buzz around town. It's so exciting. Um, Friday night, I can't believe how close it is now, but there, um, the fireworks will be held. and. I'm not going to go into great detail about all the events this weekend. I think people know about them. And if you don't know about them, you can certainly pick up a newspaper or go to the website, milton350th.org. And, um, but there are some important things to highlight, and that is some road closings and parking. <coughs> so parking will be an issue throughout the weekend. So we've established some satellite um, sites, parking sites, and we will have buses that will run throughout the weekend to these satellite sites. So on Friday night for the um, fireworks, they'll be parking at the Yulin Rink um, on Agudi Road, at the Town Hall, and um, at the Pierce Middle School in Lincoln Field, uh, Lincoln Park if needed as well. 
So buses will run continuously if you park there. We will just, we have two buses that will just run throughout the evening and provide shuttle services back and forth to the high school. On Saturday, there will be road closings, and that's even more important because um, starting at 1 o'clock, many of the roads surrounding the um, parade route will be closed. Blue Hills Parkway will be closed at Canton Nav and at Guile Road. The uh, Thatcher Street will be closed off at Central Ave. Brook Road will be closed at Reesdale Road and at Canton Nav and at Randolph Ave and at Center Street, so all those places where Brook Road intersects, and Randolph Ave at Center Street. So the parade route starts at the high school, and it marches down Canton Ave, past Town Hall, to the library, and all you have to do is follow the red, white, and blue stripes, and you'll know. Turns right at the library and goes all the way to Cunningham Park, so Reedsdale Road to Pleasant Street down to Cunningham Park. So all of those roads will be closed starting at 1 o'clock. Actually, there are more. Brook Road at Pleasant Street, Randolph Ave at Reedsdale, Randolph Ave at Pleasant Street, Randolph Ave at Chickatawbit, Otis Street at Edge Hill Road, Boulevard and Bryant Ave, Edge Hill Road and Bryant Ave. These are um, posted on the Milton, Town of Milton website. Uh, an email blast will go out on Friday with these cl road closings um, as well. But it's really important for people to know that there will not be access to Milton Hospital during this time. So um, Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital at Milton has um, sent out an alert. And um, for all medical emergencies, patients are advised to call 911 and request an ambulance because um, access from the, the entrance um, down by the police station, obviously on Reedsdale Road will not be accessible. So they, the best route to the hospital during the parade is, um, I'm sorry, by taking Route 28 and coming up the back road up through Highland Street. Um, so just, just be aware of that. An alert will go out about that as well. Um, and also on Saturday for the parades, there will be more public um, parking spots. So I just want to tell you about that. Public transportation will be rerouted but will not be impacted. And um, public parking for, along the parade route will be at Ulan Rink, at the Town Hall, at the Council on <coughs> Aging, at the Milton Academy lamp, um, lot on Randolph Ave, St. Elizabeth's lot um, at the back of St. Elizabeth's, please. And also note that St. Elizabeth's 4 o'clock mass has been moved to 4.30 on that day. Uh, parking at the DPW yard and at Cunningham and Collicott schools and at the Cunningham Foundation. So all of those lots will be available for public parking and buses will transport you. Um, so the transportation is for after the parade if you're interested in going, coming back to the high school for the fun, family fun events that will happen then. Yes. I would usually have a question during the 350th presentation, but... <laughs> There's a lot of information. Um, but is the hospital going to be closed, you, or do you just have to take the alternate route to the hospital? No, the hospital won't be closed. Okay. But, um, they're asking that only, you know, medical emergencies. And right, but if you, um, if it is a med medical emergency, to call 911 for an, uh, an ambulance is what they're asking. Can you, can you come in mm -hmm. from 28 through the uh, Highland Street there, or through the back way? Yes, yeah, so police will be blocking off the road from Chickatawba, but if it's for an emergency, they will let people through. Okay. In other words, you shouldn't go to the hospital to visit someone <laughs> during that two hour block, I guess is that. kind of what they're saying. Sorry. Um, so the weather it looks like it's cooperating. I'll just say a couple of things. Come early on Friday night at six o'clock. The campus will be open at the high school. There'll be plenty of food available to purchase. I would suggest if, you, if you're coming to maybe bring a tarp to put under your blanket because the ground might be wet from all the rain this week and maybe bring some bug spray because it might be a little mosquitoes out there. Um, on, sun, on Saturday for the parade, the, the weather forecast is glorious and um, the 350th committee has new hats that you can purchase along the parade route. So uh, we encourage you to pick one up. I'm sorry I forgot to bring mine tonight. And uh, sunscreen always is important. So 
Don't forget your cameras. It's going to be a memorable weekend, and we'll wrap up at um, the Town Green in front of Town Hall on Sunday at noontime with a gigantic cake being um, prepared for us by Blue Hills Regional and um, fun activities, music, um, magic tricks, free hay rides, and again, more food to purchase. So, uh, full weekend, and I hope that hope to see you out there. Thank you. I may I say something? Go right ahead. Um, on this food for sale, <laughs> I want to remind everyone that all of the food sales, thanking the 350th, will be divided among the six PTOs, fame, and boosters. And i.e., all of those parents and guardians from those organizations are staffing all of um, these stations. So um, though, on behalf of those groups, they're very appreciative. Uh, and they have been turning out, signing up on the sign-up sheet. So if we weren't planning to, we should have a sign on each food stand that says the proceeds will be donated, because I think that Absolutely. might Absolutely. I think that that's already been taken care of. Good, Good reminder, though. I think that's my job. <laughs> I don't think so. Anything else on 350? Sounds great. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll move on. Um, at our last meeting, uh, we had uh, put together a process for filling our school committee uh, open seat. Um, it was Wednesday of last week. There were still two days left in the uh, timeline to express interest in the process. We had five people. We had decided we would bring them in and we would have to do roughly half an hour with each person tonight. And lo and behold, in the next less than 48 hours, um, between that meeting and uh, the Friday deadline, we got eight other applications. Um, Twelve applica applications at half an hour each would strain even the most rabid public, te you know, public access television viewer, not to mention those of us at the table. Um, so we, uh, we need to come up with a, a different process. Obviously, we're not bringing 12 people in tonight. We were, um, we, what I put on the agenda really is a discussion of, of how we want to proceed with this. We have a number of options open to us from revising our interview process through trying to do an initial screening through whatever. It is, it is up to the body. The only thing prescribed in all of this, and I should just say that for the, for the public, the only thing prescribed in this whole uh, process of filling a, a vacant seat is the very beginning of the process where it says you have to give seven days notice to the registered voters of the town, and the very end of the process which says it has to be a joint meeting of the school committee and the selectmen at which point a roll call vote is taken. And uh, eight people being eligible to vote, um, five votes are necessary regardless of how many people are here. So other than the very beginning of the process, which we've complied with, and the very end of the process, which we will comply with, the middle of the process is, uh, is up to us in that sense. Um, so uh, I'm looking for, you know, this all course happened after our last school committee meeting, and therefore we were unable to discuss it in any way to talk about how we might accomplish this. Um, so I'm putting it up for discussion now is what is your pleasure as to how to deal with um, the unexpected riches of our uh, number of applications. Mr. Walker, so I have. Well, this, this being my area of expertise, I do have some ideas. <laughs> uh, I was the leading advocate for 30-minute um, interviews when we had four candidates. I think that is no longer feasible. Uh, but, I, but I still think that um, two things that, that should drive our thinking. One is that I think um, for each of those individuals that has expressed interest, uh, they probably have earned the opportunity to be heard. And thus, I would propose 15-minute interviews for each candidate. Uh, our initial thought about the process was we would use this meeting to discuss qualifications and our ideas about what might qualify individuals. I don't think there's any need for that any longer if we're going to interview each candidate. So I think uh, I would propose that we consider 15-minute uh, interviews for each of the 12 candidates. Uh, logistically, we should probably all ask them to be here uh, at 8 or 7.45 and start at 8 and that we uh, determine the order at that time. I'll give some thinking to that. but. Uh, I think we all we want them all here. We actually we want them all in 
some location uh, and we'll work on a standard set of questions but obviously we don't we would prefer that candidates not trade questions and information about the questions between each other it, logistically we're, we're set for 8 o'clock next week because of conflicts with scheduling with some of the members of the Board of Selectmen they couldn't make it here before 8 o'clock so we also have the volunteer reception at 6 o'clock which basically precluded us from beginning before 730 anyway so the the extra half hour is not um, not terribly uh, restrictive we uh, our agenda would consist of nothing that night except this um, we are, are that it's another point of discussion we'll pick up later on we were going to hold our retreat meeting on the 20th um, and we have some discussion about whether how to how to deal with that but we'll handle that after the certainly the issue would be next week we with an eight o'clock start we would be doing nothing but this appointment process Ms. Sheridan I'm wondering if we could possibly do the presentations to the Copeland Foundation and I know that you just raised it so that's why I'm, I'm talking about it but at 730 and then have that meeting go at 8 because um, it maybe could look into that we'll look into it okay so I I would like to was that an official motion that you made because I, I, I move that we um, afford each candidate that has applied um, a 15 minute interview uh, with interviews to begin at 8 and candidates required to be here at 745 I'll second it. Oh, okay. seconded by my Sheridan um, logistically we would have that would bring us till 11 correct so were you considering as part of that that we would then vote I mean yes the, um, the, the selectmen are posted for that night they were interested in being here for the meeting at which we voted they weren't necessarily interested in the meeting for which we did preliminary work uh, in my conversation with the chair of the board of selectmen um, they felt that since it was our position if there was going to be an initial screening they, they proposed that we would do that and they would just come in at the end of the process um, but we are we do have a, a jointly posted meeting with them for next week um, I, I would imagine they would have some interest in, in he, being this but I, in, in hearing the discussion but I, my wonder is well, is that is it 11 o'clock vote feasible is I mean, I'm up late, but I mean, we, we have to decide whether we're all fried at that point or not. <laughs> Ms. Sheridan. I'd like to say a couple of things about that. First of all, I, I think that 15 minutes to interview all people is too long of a time. I think it's unfair to interview someone at 1030 or quarter of 11 at night. And if we could reduce that time to 10 minutes, it would be more manageable and get us out in a more, not, not the getting out part, but getting I'm really mindful of the people being interviewed at that late late time. And I'm also wondering if um, some component of an interview, but also if we could just ask them to come with a statement, a prepared statement to make on why they would why they're interested in running for school committee, and then maybe have one question that we ask each person. So a shorter time frame, accomplish it in a reasonable amount of time and um, I don't know if you'll accept that as a friendly amendment or if we're just, just is this, we're, we're in discussion right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Ms. Kelly. So if this is considered preliminary work and um, given the, the potential length of interviews um, that perhaps another meeting would be, a joint meeting would be required to actually take the vote, we could, start could we then start the meeting earlier mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure that I, I think 15 minutes is probably around the time, at least allocated 15 minutes um, to interview, I think would be um, the right amount of time. Um, and then hopefully if we could start earlier, it would not be so late. I'm wondering if that's. I could see if that's uh, you know, acceptable to the select, but I, I, th um, I think the issue of them coming to the second meeting was somehow that we would have a basically a preliminary judgment or a preliminary recommendation that they would weigh in on. We wouldn't necessarily be doing that in this case. We would have just held the interviews with the 12 people and then they would come in the next meeting for, for a vote. Um, 
absent the opportunity necessarily to have heard the people though. I mean, we, we would have heard the people, the 12 people, unless they were watching on TV, they may not have seen it. I mean, I, I, will that, would, that, would that affect their ability to make a vote as well? I'm just thinking in terms of, you know, if, if I hadn't heard any of the interviews, how would I vote? Um, you know, it, it, I think where they're coming from is, that, for instance, the last time this was done was with the library board of trustees when there was a vacancy on that. And the remaining eight members of the library interviewed people and said, this is the person we would like to have, brought it to the selectmen and said, this is the person we'd like to have. The selectmen voted and said, sure. Right? They, they voted, it's your member, going to be on your board. I think you know, their interest in being in a final vote was probably somehow thinking that we were doing some sort of a similar process. If we are just doing 12 interviews the first night and then open discussion and vote the second night, it isn't really a similar process to that of the library trustees and, you know, are they, how comfortable would they be with that? I mean, it's a question I'm going to have to ask reasonably. Right. So I'm, I guess I'm trying to figure out what the difference is because if in the first process the potential is to bring them our candidate and say, will you vote for this particular person? And they say yes. What's the difference in the presentation about us going through a process of interviewing all potential candidates, perhaps starting the beginning of the joint meeting with a discussion amongst ourselves, and then asking the Board of Selectmen to well, join Well, I, I think there has to be that intermediate step, I would say. I right. mean, if, if you've jumped straight from the interviews to a vote, I think yep. it, it, no, I think it disadvantages them. Um, <laughs> yep. you, no, I would agree. At least if they were a part of it, or, or at least privy to a discussion that we held, about it at that point, they'd be in a better position to make a vote. But I, I, I can approach them about scheduling a they different time. They meet tomorrow time. night. Oh. They meet tomorrow night. I'm actually going to that meeting if you want me to raise it then. I'll, I'll give the chair a call and okay. we'll work something out and see what we can, what we can post. Um, we can still um, invite them to next week's meeting if they choose to come. And we'll, we can, it's jointly posted as it is now. We can always. Um, you know, they're, they're certainly welcome to come. They may choose not to, but we'll talk to them about it. I'll talk to the chair about it and see how he feels about that, whether they'd rather or rather not. Um, the, uh, you, to your suggestion, we probably can't bring it up much before 7.30. We, get, we can get ourselves a half an hour with the uh, next week volunteer. because we have the volunteer reception. What time does that start? Six. Six. And in, in, in the past, it's pretty much precluded us from starting before 7.30. It was a lot of volunteers. And we have to dish up that ice cream for them. <laughs> so if that was a friendly amendment, I, I would accept um, two friendly amendments. One, one is that we investigate the possibility of a 7 o'clock start time. I think an hour for the volunteer reception could work. And therefore, uh, we interview the candidates from the period 7 to 10 rather than 8 to 11. I'll, I'll accept that. Can we get the volunteer reception done in an hour, Ms. Gorman, do you think? Yes. I mean, there's a, a lot of things to hand out. <laughs> my, my only concern is I don't want right. to rush those people out. No, I, I don't either, but an hour. And I don't want to keep people here waiting I think we can on the other end who have been told to come at 7 o'clock if we're still downstairs dish guys I'd, to volunteer. I'd volunteer to be here at 6.45 to start the logistics. I think we can do that. You think we can do that? Yes. All right. All right. Clarifying question? Yes. So then you're saying 15 minutes, 7, seven o'clock, 15 minutes. Correct. And standard questions. Correct. Uh, that would be designed by you and we would look at them? Yes, that would time. be approved by all of us. Okay. Okay, and so after we vote on that, we'll talk about the qualifications. Or if we need to. I'm, I'm not sure if we're interviewing each candidate we need to talk about qualifications, but because we, our thought initially was we would talk about qualifications and screen out, but if we're not going to screen out, then everybody meets the minimum qualifications, so just see how they distinguish themselves in the interview. Okay. 
my, uh, and uh, you're right, and qualifications is not the right word, and I don't know what word it is. I think that I have a couple of concerns I want to express ahead of time for folks to think about. Okay. Sort of them thinking about their own qualifications and demands. How, how they present for. themselves. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. not a qualification, but I get it. Uh, here are some concerns I to think it. about before yeah. you come for your interview. Right. So what would we call that? It's not qualifications, but it's... Well, I mean, if, if you have concerns that you... Th I'm just trying to figure the best way to, uh, well, it, to, to <coughs> express this, because I, I, I want to okay. make sure that if, if you're going to express something that you'd like the candidates to hear and react to, I have to get it out to them. I mean, they're not all here or oh, watching on TV. Right. right, so I don't want to, I, I want to make sure everybody has the same information coming forward to this meeting. So I, I, I really want to make sure that we're, you know, so don't in any way disadvantage anyone. I know Linda, we had her hand up. Well, I was just going to say that kind of goes back to what I was saying. If we gave them all a, a, a moment to say, to speak without being interviewed, just saying what their rationale was for running, um, what their platform was, is, so to speak, you know. I'm, why are you running? Just because, mm -hmm. you know, why? Tell us why. Mm -hmm. what, what, what are your interests? What are your rationale? So <coughs> I would be interested in having that included in the 15-minute interview. So we would give them some three to five minutes at the beginning and then ask a couple questions? I mean, usually when you go to a debate, that's what they have. They have, you know, closing comments or, you know, you, you have a chance to speak your own some well I would say in, a, in, a, in an interview you, you would have that opportunity as well no. so if you've been watching out there all this time 99% of the time I agree with Linda Lee <laughs> but in this case I, I wouldn't accept that as a friendly amendment here's why because I think the idea here is to find out as much about them as we can and we'll have some questions that we think accomplish that most effectively. If we get through that, and this happens in interviews all the time, we ask, they answer with one, two, or three word answers, and we're done in 10 minutes, then we say, do you have any questions or anything you'd like to say? But I would, I'm not sure we'll be able to guarantee that for each candidate, because some handle the interviews different than others. And I, and I wouldn't want to give up five minutes of a 15 minute interview. Okay. So my issues are not about qualifications. I'm realizing they're more about how can the questions be phased. So I have some. So I don't. I mean, I could say them now. I can pass them on to in an email. But I could explain <coughs> what my concerns are in I terms of it. directing the questions. I get it, and okay. we can we can address that. Okay. So I should just address them via email. Yes. Okay. Yes, Mr. Walker. Will draft a set of questions. People have concerns that they'd like to see in the questions, just forward them to him and, and that way we can do that. I mean, this we obviously can't discuss the questions right. in open session here. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Of course. In the open meeting law, we can't have back and, and we forth can't about it. We can't have discussion so anywhere else, it's but more you can or less give information to Mr. Walker to try right. to draft something. Do we... Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, Ms. Kelly, to please, see please. everybody's questions that they come up with. Is that yes. an email change? Mm, well, you get, you get yes, yes, you get to see Mary. Yes, you get. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me finish the statement, please. So, anytime someone suggests a revision a revised draft would be sent out and therefore you get to see everyone's edits. Ms. Kelly. So I would argue that this will be a um, violation of the open meeting law. Oh. And that really the way to do this is through administration where individual members would submit to the superintendent our questions and that we might need to even ask for uh, an exemption to meet in executive session to oops, determine the questions that we would be uh, asking to interview on. Because otherwise, we're supposed to be in public session in front of cameras. Mm -hmm. 
that's essentially sort of the way we operate, right? Mm -hmm. So if we have a discussion that says, yep, we're all in agreement, these are all the questions, one would think that the questions are then would need to at least be read aloud and we would all need to agree on them. And I don't know that we have a process yeah. other than just submitting to the administration. It is, it is tricky because a, 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 a preliminary screening is an exemption under the open meeting law. But Correct. That's for a hire. This isn't a hire. Correct. It, it, it is as close to a hire as we it's can possibly close, get. But I, I, and I would, why would I would we, ask for an opinion before we did it, I think. Why, then we should ask for an opinion. Yeah. And, yeah. and why would we involve the administration in the development of a school committee interview process. That makes no sense to Well, me. only to facilitate the collection of a, a number of questions. But listen, if there's an exemption that we can utilize, I think we should. Um, we just need to figure out what the, what the steps are in terms of, of us being able to collect questions, come up with a, a, a set to present in executive session if allowed. In the public, there's only two possibilities for getting a position. You, three, volunteer, appoint, or elect. This is an appointment, and this is a hiring process. But let's get an opinion. We'll get an opinion. That's, a, that's the safest way. Right. Um, absent that, um, the, the fallback position, I would say, is people would uh, submit questions in to, uh, let's say, to the superintendent's office or somewhere. Charlene would pass them along to you. Roy would try to craft something from it, but we wouldn't be able to go further than that. Correct. We'd just have to present them. We'll, we'll have to leave it to Leroy to try to craft them together into one document because any subsequent back and forth beyond that could mm -hmm. be considered an open meeting issue. So I think um, we'll get an opinion as fast as we can as to uh, how to go forward, and I will get out a message to you. But if you have questions you are uh, considering, you should think about them and probably we might as well have you have everyone just submit them initially into through Charlene let's say anyway just to collect them in one place um, and so they'll either go to Laura for whatever kind of discussion we can have or they'll just go to Laura to draft something and we'll, one way or the other we might as well get them underway and get them in we don't have a lot of time between no, here and between now and then um, and if possible if it, it turns out there's an open meeting exemption to for this we can have a very brief executive session beforehand for you know 10 minutes and just make sure we're all on board with the questions i mean if it's if it's determined that this is within the realm of that open meeting exemption we'll just do a quick executive session so we can all go over them and say yeah 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 no be done with it that way but i'll i'll, I'll get an opinion from Joe, from a, the attorney general's office thanks Glenn. So that's uh, your your motion is uh, motion is starting at seven next week. Fifteen minutes a person. Candidate, to be asked, all can candidates required to be here at six forty-five. All candidates will be. Oh, I'll, I'll say all candidates will be asked to be here at six forty-five. I don't know what I can require of anyone. Um. <laughs> be here or not? If it's <laughs> I'm not going to say if they don't, if they're here at six forty-eight. We're not going to listen <laughs> to them. I, we'll have to we'll have to work that out. Um, and we'll determine a way whether we'll draw names out of a hat or something like this to uh, to determine an order or something right. like that. Random order. I think. The that's random that's order is probably the easiest way. Yeah. So we have a motion on the floor. Any further discussion thereof? All right. Hearing none. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Anything else we need to discuss on the matter of filling this vacancy for next week? Any other? Just yes. the voting process, do we need to shore that up? The voting process we're proposing, or what we've discussed anyways, is... The, the law says a roll call vote, which I take it to mean we will go around the table in some order, probably random, of the eight voting members or whoever are here that night and say, you know, Miss Kelly, what is your vote? And we will go until someone gets five votes. But I guess what I'm asking about is the, process, the interim process. So, we'll oh, we could have interviews. a discussion after the interviews and then help Colt vote that way and see what happens. Well, I, I thought one of the things we discussed was maybe starting um, the beginning of the, the joint meeting the following week, mm -hmm. if that was what the date was arranged, um, that we would have a discussion, some sort of discussion. I'm, I'm not sure. 
again, are we, it, it, will this be discussed or do we just go from interviews to vote? I guess that's my question. I can't imagine we could possibly go from interviews without discussion. We are okay. we were a group that likes to discuss things. <laughs> right. I don't that's think true. I could do that if I tried. So, so <laughs> my arms aren't long enough and the gavel isn't heavy enough to keep this table from discussing. <laughs> So the question is, is the discussion happen at the following meeting, at the beginning of the following meeting, or are we planning it for the end of, you know, after 10 o'clock or whatever time that ends up being? Um, and to piggyback on that question, Mary, are we going to just cast one vote for one person, or are we going to pick the top three? I mean, I think, again, the dynamics changed greatly when our numbers went from 4 to 12. I had proposed at the last meeting about just doing some kind of rank order. It doesn't have to be all the way to 12, but if we could just pick our top, it doesn't, you don't even have to say one, two, three, and four, but just top four. And then there has to be some way to get from 12 down to a reasonable number, I think. Unless you disagree. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it could be the case that on the first ballot, eight people vote for eight different people. We'll discuss and we will go on and re-vote and I think as we discuss things and go forward, things will shake out. I'm, I'm not... Right. So, so I guess that's where I'm a little bit confused. Either we as a school committee will come, will basically go through a process, whatever that looks like, and present it to the Board of Selectmen for a <coughs> final vote or all eight of us will participate in that. And I guess that's sort of where I'm a little bit, I don't know what our direction is at this point. Well, what would be the preference? I mean, we could do it either way. I mean, that's not constrained by um, the, the outline process in the law. We could, we could as the, as the um, library trustees did in, in their case, um, go forward with a single candidate for that final vote. I think I'd like to know the will of the selectmen on that. Is that what they'd like us to do, or do they want to be active participants in the My decision? conversation with the chair was, I mean, that basically this was our member, and they were, you know, yielding to us on who we would like to serve with on our committee. Um, I will verify that. That's easy enough to do, that, that's, that this process is fine. I mean, but the question is, I think Mary's question is a good one. Do we do a discussion following the interviews on next our next meeting or does that begin a discussion at the following meeting where possibly we start at seven and the selectmen join us at eight and, and you know or they're part of it at eight if at seven if they so choose i mean we could do it either way I mean, I don't, I don't. well you might want to factor in that i have a scheduling conflict i'm going to be in arkansas with a consulting client on the 20th so i won't be here Well, that does bring the issue when the subsequent meeting would be. Now, we do have, we are, we have the joint meeting post on the 13th. The selectmen generally meet on Thursday nights, but they're meeting tomorrow. Tomorrow's we, Thursday. Uh, I know, but that would mean they're not meeting on the 14th, which would be the, the next night, but they would presumably be available um, as uh you know, they, they usually have Thursday nights free. I mean, we could possibly do a joint meeting on the 14th at the 20th, isn't, you know, maybe do it in their venue. I don't know if it's, no, too many of us around the table there probably, but. What about the 21st, are you gone for the week or are you? Uh, yeah. 20th and 21st. Okay. I, I mean, we, I really would, would rather get this nailed down and buttoned up in, in the short run. I, mean, this is, <laughs> I don't want this to be a summer event. Yeah. We, need to, we need to get this done with. Can um, I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So the 13th is when we interview them. Possibly the 14th is when we would meet for our discussion and our vote. And then the 20th, we would still keep with the selectmen? No. The, or no. would we do all of it on the 14th, the vote with the selectmen on the 14th? I, uh, my impression was the select, vote with the selectmen would be the 14th. Okay, so can we do the 14th? Uh, are people available on Thursday the 14th? Do we know? People know your calendars well enough? I can be. I know I'm available because it's a consolidated facilities meeting at 6, so I know I have that evening free and I can 
be here for that. I've got a town government study, but this is more important, so I'll, I'll have to miss that. I will check with the selectman and to see if this works. And if they can't, is there any benefit to us going ahead without them because Mr. Walker could be with us? Well, there is, I mean, if we were to go ahead without them and agree on a candidate, and then we were meet with them, say, when Mr. Walker was away, mm -hmm. we still require five votes. It's not but majority of those present and voting. It's majority of those eligible to vote. Oh. It's, it's a bizarre right. rule, but it's mass general laws, and that's enough said. If the so, 14th didn't work, could we meet on the 19th? Sorry to interrupt. 19th is? Tuesday the 19th. Does that work for you? Yeah, I could. Does that work for other folks? Just to give us a, a, a plan. I'll, if it works, I'll, I'll present to the selectmen and see what we can work out. I'll give them a call tomorrow morning and see what. Backing seven? Probably. Well, if, if those dates are all right, I mean, the preference would be, would people's preference be the 14th and then with the backup of the 19th? Does that work for people or? You know, I have no preference. No preference? The 14th is fine. Ms. Kelly, any? I would prefer the 19th. If You'd prefer the 19th? Yeah. How about Ms. Gorman? Ms. Gorman? No. I'm free all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Maybe the preference, uh, minor preference then for the 19th. So let's see what we can, let, let me talk to the chair of the board of selectmen and see what we work out. But we will do it for, we will try to aim for one of those two nights, either the Thursday the 14th or Tuesday the 19th okay. for the follow-up. And I will talk to them as to whether they want to retain the 13th as a jointly posted meeting, whether they want to be here for the interviews or not. We'll leave that up to them. Um, but in any case, we'll jointly post the other meeting with them. And so there will be no meeting on the 20th? We'll come back to that. <laughs> we, because we do need a, a regularly scheduled meeting of our own at some point. So we, um, we'll, because uh, all of this leaves a, a lot of other things on the table that we still have to deal with. I mean, these are nights that we're taking on a, a single topic and we have, other, we have other things as well. Anything else though on this? Um, all right, I will uh, give the chair of the selectman a call tomorrow. I will find out the ruling on questions vis-a-vis -vis the open meeting law, and we'll see what we can come up with as fast as we can come up with it. Um, the second item, <laughs> only the second <laughs> item, the chairman's report is the uh, school committee retreat date um, tying into this whole discussion. We had the 20th scheduled as a, our retreat. Um, the uh, administration is having their own retreat and it is after the 20th a date quite un, not firmed up yet but it's something like the 22nd through the 29th time frame there in any case it is after the 22nd it makes sense to allow the administration to have their internal retreat wrapping up the year before they present it to us mm -hmm. to wrap up the year so um, I would propose we, we postpone our retreat from the end of June till beginning of July we'll have to set a date for that um, in any case I was going to suggest that um, we have some other business to attend to and maybe the 20th we would hold as a regular meeting um, but we'll have, um, do we have uh, policy on that night we <laughs> have the social media policy for that night or anything like that because if we're doing policy I just sort of have the right here um, also, on the, well, we have on the 20th so far, we were going to bring in the... Um, to Mr. Walker's request, the alcohol abuse. And if you're not, so we could push that uh, to another date. Mm -hmm. He's not going to be here. Well, I know. So. So the Can I ask you a question? Why, why would we meet the 19th and the 20th? I mean, I love you all, but two nights in a row? <laughs> Can't we do business? We're doing this for the money. I know, I know. It's a big <laughs> paycheck. And it sounds well. um, but couldn't we, I mean, won't we have time to do a few business items on the 19th if we needed to? No? We might. Okay. I, I, I'm reluctant to, okay. to 
guess how long uh, the discussion and vote will last. I have no idea. I, there, there are certain things I try never to predict. <laughs> things like that would be among them. Okay. Which way, how, uh, how long a discussion is going to last with any body is I'll one of those things that could just turn on a dime. <laughs> Mr. Walker, you had a well, I, I agree with Ms. Bagley Jones as usual, and uh, <laughs> unlike, <laughs> <laughs> and and we had just said that that would probably be the presentation of the data regarding the first grade <laughs> assignment planning. So I absolutely want to be present for that discussion. So I would respectfully request that we not schedule business on the twentieth. Okay. So if we can. Then the, our first preference for the follow-up meeting would be the, the 19th, and we would have that initially, our discussion in, with the selectmen, and then after that, move on to some limited number of business items that we can uh, knock off in the same evening, and then or hopefully not be here past uh, midnight. Or if you have, or if you agree on the 14th, then we could have the meeting on the 19th. Mm -hmm. But then we're having. 13th and 14th meetings, and that was Ms. Becker Johnson. Just another agenda item we need to have um, Ada and the Copelands in one of those yes. nights somewhere. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have to work that in. All right, so let me see what I can work out with <coughs> selectmen, and then we'll try to work in our meetings. Con right, and concurrent ba with that. balancing my various commitments to the town. So, I had the town government study which I'm scheduled to make a presentation at on the 14th, so the 19th works better, but All right. that one I'll work around the will of the committee. Well, we've had two preferences for the 19th, so let me see if I can do that. Is there an issue with the 19th? Mr. Phelan won't be here. Mr. Phelan, we won't be able to elect you to the school committee. You won't, no. <laughs> <laughs> that may impact the first grade. Presentation of Mr. Fallon's not here on the 19th. We'll have, we'll, we will work this out. All right. Um, this is like making sausage. No one needs to see this. We'll work it out. <laughs> All right. Um, the other issue uh, that is on my agenda here is uh, listed as ASPE Local 1395 Council 93 FLCIO contract. Um, this is to report out that at our executive session last week, we ratified an agreement with our. Uh, custodial and um, food service workers unit. Um, it's been a, a long time coming. Uh, it involves, among other things, the creation of a weekend shift for our custodians, which is going to save us some overtime money. Um, it, it involves an agreement that um, uh, we will be able to have members of the Consolidated Facilities Department do work inside our schools and we will have members of uh, employees of the schools do work, be able to do work in other buildings. So a first um, uh, start of the implementation of the Consolidated Facilities even before people are actually transferred among different schools or different uh, parts of the town. So I mean basically it's, it's an agreement to allow everyone to work together across the various different contracts. Um, in return, it's a, a, a two percent uh, wage adjustment in, in the two years of the contract. So that was uh, voted at our last um, ex executive session meeting. And I know, Mr. Lore, I wanted to, Mr. Walker, wanted to address that briefly. Yeah, perfect lead-in. And I voted no on that contract because I felt that there was a key uh, consolidated facility issue that hadn't been addressed. And as a result of uh, some extraordinary cooperation from uh, Jason and the Custodians Union, I'm pleased to say that I can now vote yes. <coughs> so I've asked for a revote so that we can make that a unanimous vote. Mary's frowning. They were, uh, they. Just a question uh, mark in my they, head. No, I, it was a big one, though. They, yes, it they, was. They agreed to uh, do a side letter that addressed my concern about making sure the consolidated facilities language had the same expiration as the uh, expiration of the overall agreement. So now those two will be the same. The original agreement called for? As you might recall, the original agreement said 12 months from date of execution, and I said, why wouldn't this expire at the same time that the agreement expires? So we talked to them, 
they said, uh, with quite a bit of help from the superintendent, uh, they said that they would be willing to execute a side letter that extends that through the term of the agreement. So, so that removes my concern. It's a difference of some 24, 25 days. Right. Uh, one year from the execution would have had it expire early in June instead of June 30th at the end of the agreement. So this would basically extend that provision for another th three plus weeks. Ms. Kelly. So that's great news and great work. Um, I would think the side letter requires a vote of the school committee to be enacted. Um, so I don't know whether that's a, we could have a public vote to that effect or. We, we can. I mean, it's been discussed in public. There's nothing yeah. open meeting about it. I mean, I would. That would be great. Um, entertain a motion to uh, authorize the chair to sign a letter of agreement with the ASME Council. So move. Extending that provision of the contract through June 30th. Second. Moved by Mr. Walker, seconded by Ms. Sheridan. Any discussion? And on the contract? Um, well, let's take one at a time. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so uh, on the side letter, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Um, it, it's a little odd to reopen a motion that occurred in executive session, but um, it, just, but just I think for it's, me. I think it. I think if Mr. Walk, uh, <coughs> someone who voted on the prevailing side would like to vote to reconsider it, so we could, for the purpose of making it a unanimous vote, I so could moved. entertain that. Second. Can I second? Yes. <laughs> Anyone can second it. It just has to be someone who voted on the prevailing side who moves it yeah. for a reconsideration. I would say that uh, sufficient time has passed that this would require a two-thirds vote. All those in favor of reconsidering? All right. And so the motion, of, uh, entertain a motion to approve the AFSCME contract as, um, as previously uh, distributed. So moved. Second. Second. No, hearing no discussion, all those in favor? Oh. Good job. <laughs> An emphatic unanimous, right? <laughs> <laughs> as we blow out the speakers. All right. So uh, it will go on record that we unanimously uh, endorse the, uh, uh, unanimously ratify the, the AFSCME agreement. That would conclude my report, and I'd move on to the policy subcommittee. So you have before you uh, two policies, unlike the agenda, which shows three, but as and the chair said earlier we've removed social networking although a brief report on that we are very close we've had two very productive discussions with uh, the union Margaret and uh, they've actually made some very helpful suggestions so I would expect we would have that at our what will hopefully be our June 19th meeting uh, the two policies you have before me name uh, before you naming new facilities uh, as you might recall Several months ago, the chair referred to the policy committee uh, a request to develop a uh, policy regarding signage on buildings. Uh, in undertaking that, we did some research, including uh, working with Mass Association of School Committees to look at policies that they had. We looked at the policies of six or seven other school districts. and. Uh, have now developed a combined policy which addresses naming new facilities. So we had a policy which addressed that, but we think this one is an improved policy in that regard. And we added uh, some very brief content on uh, requests that we might get for memorials and requests that we might get for signage on the outside of buildings. So this policy addresses all three of those. It's pretty straightforward. So. So this is I'm happy to take questions if there are any. This is a first reading, so this is a chance to react to any of this. Ms. Kelly. Um, just in terms of the employees, it always has to be a former employee? Is that That's the thought. That's the thought. And so with that in mind, would we also, at least when, when considering um, names of building, also have something to that effect? that, um, I don't know, the person being considered could, couldn't, I guess I, I'm just wondering why we wouldn't have that same type of um, uh, language around naming of buildings, the naming of buildings being even that more important. Well, it, 
that's actually the intent. If you, the, the first sentence tries to define what we mean by facilities. So facilities includes buildings, athletic facilities, libraries, uh, auditoriums, and other special purpose rooms. So the intent is that that covers all of this. The, the paragraph that I think you're referring to, again, tries to, it starts with a sentence which tries to make that as broad as possible. So it's buildings, the room within, rooms within those buildings, and properties associated with those buildings. So I think, in my view, we have covered that, but are, is that not clear? Yeah, I guess I was thinking, it seemed like uh, the middle section and the bottom section are really two different things, right? So the, the naming of, well, I guess this is where it's coming from, I guess, right? Yeah. So, I guess, so I guess first, my concern that, go ahead. is um, sitting elected officials. So if someone is an elected official still serving, you know, the community in whatever respect, I, I, I don't know that that's an appropriate time to be naming anything similar to an employee of the Milton Public Schools. It's, it really should be a recognition <coughs> after having served. I guess that would be my perspective. And I didn't know whether we might want to put some language into that effect. Because I think, you know, the impression may be when, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, it's just the way of the world when we talk about politics, that, um, you know, if someone is a sitting official, it does, it does create some, I think, um, impressions that perhaps we would want to avoid as a school committee. And I think um, language could be crafted that would sort of deal with that, similar to what is put in here about public employees. Are you talking specifically, um, Mrs. Kelly, about the naming of buildings or any of these? I don't know. It, I guess that's where I'm getting a little bit confused. So if, if the, in the case of a former employee, if that's for all, then perhaps we should consider it for all for, for elected officials as well. I guess, you know, that's. So we currently have that here. Um, but that was that, that donation. So Senator Brian A. Joyce Auditorium at Pierce Middle School um, that naming was part of the Copeland Family Foundation donation. They had naming rights to <coughs> facilities. Right, and we didn't have a policy around that. We weren't, you know, it, when that happened, right? So I guess the, the, the opportunity when you're creating a policy or refining a policy is to say how would we would like to see it going forward. And I think that's what I'm speaking to okay. is not that I would say anything that's happened before should be taken away, but I think it's just something that we should consider um, as we put into policy, uh, you know, sort of the thoughts about this. So let me try to frame that question a little differently. So if you look at the criteria that we will consider, and if you look at the, the um, top paragraph on the second page, last sentence, We've set the bar pretty high in terms of what kind of approval is required. So we've said a five-sixth majority. So five of the six of us have to vote to approve any naming. So with that in mind, if you look at these, these four um, criteria, this is in the second paragraph on the first page, special, special, <laughs> special significance of the named individual to the facility and the students it serves, Outstand, outstanding contributions to the school and or school community, names that have a special meaning to the students in the community or that enhance the core values of the school, and or commemorative names made at the request of major contributors. So if, if you think about those criteria, would you, are there other criteria you would add? No, I, I <coughs> and maybe I'm, I'm not reading this correctly, but in the paragraphs that follow. Yeah. Is that talking about the same issue, or are we separating issues? It's, it's talking about the same issue, but it's zeroing in on former employees. So for former employees, those individuals would have to have been away for at least five years, must have had a minimum of 25 years employment with the Milton Public Schools, um, received the recommendation of the current administrative head of the building in which, and council in which they worked, 
and be recommended by the current superintendent. So tho those particular points apply to individuals that are working in the Milton Public Schools, have worked in the Milton Public Schools. Well, I, I don't know if that's the way it reads then. I guess okay. Maybe I have, yeah. So the, the beginning of that paragraph um, talks, the last sentence in the paragraph above those bullets is in order to receive such an honor, individuals or groups must. And then it goes into the case of a former employee. Yeah. So, so to me, it seems like it's not flowing. Um, it, it, anyways, uh, I think if, if you might allow, if we might, well, this is only the first reading anyways. Mm -hmm. So let me try and take a, a crack at how, um, what I'm trying to get at might be worded and where it would fit in here best. Wonderful. Would that be okay? That would be excellent. Excellent. Let me do that. Thank you. Ben. Yes. Um, I just had a couple of questions or thoughts about this. Sure. Okay. So on the committee may seek recommendations. I th and Mary, you help me with this, Mary, uh, Ms. Gormley. Um, I guess I'd like to, s it says faculty administration, but I guess I'd like to specify superintendent because I think that the sup somewhere in there, because the superintendent is often involved with naming rights for a foundation or a large corporation or whomever like the Copeland Foundation Mary was intricately involved in that and that's often part of some initial negotiations with uh, asking folks for large amounts of money and I don't mean Mary should make those decisions but I think she should be named in this it just says faculty administration and I can't really see the superintendent not superseding any so other staff. So we're saying that she has to she has to recommend any recommendation recommendation that's made to her well I was going to say that in the second part but in this first part around yeah. the naming rights yeah I think it would be helpful for there to be some kind of freedom or vetting process that the superintendent is involved with in terms of naming rights it sh that this position is named the superintendent's position is in there let's let's figure out where where that should go because I, I don't think you want the superintendent making recommendations of her own. No, but in terms of before it be, uh, Mary, help me out on this. When there's a foundation or a group that may give us money, there may be some initial discussion that isn't public knowledge yet mm -hmm. between the superintendent, and I don't think that would be appropriate for it to be anybody but the superintendent from a staff's point of view but also that she needs a little leeway to maybe get some of those conversations with the chair of the school committee going as compared to us deciding here in a public venue. I don't think that's appropriate when we're trying to approach people for large amounts of money. Well, I, if we're going to <coughs> solicit a, a donation from somebody and the, yep. the quid pro quo is the naming of the building, I think that's got to come here. I oh, can't. yeah. But I don't know how much initial going back and forth or how much of the initial topic gets introduced by the superintendent before it comes to us for a public vote or a discussion with you. Maybe it's in the second part where it says at the bottom be recommended by the current superintendent of schools. Maybe that covers it. So it is there. It says it's on the second and part and that's I, I wanted it more around the naming that I don't know but so maybe I'm splitting hairs there. But then my other concern was is to move up the current superintendent of schools before the current administrative head of the building. I mean, we shouldn't have an administrative head of the building bringing this to a vote in his or her site council and then asking the superintendent. It's got to go through the superintendent before it comes from any staff. So to your first point, Kristen, you mm -hmm. said, um, I'm looking at the second paragraph where it says yep. the committee may seek recommendations from school or community groups, school committee appointed subcommittees, faculty and administration, students and others in naming facilities. So the administration is there? We may seek, we don't have to. So you want it to say? I don't know, maybe well, it's covered in the second part, but I just, I want to bring it up where I don't think it's, the superintendent has a little more to do with this. But you're not foreclosing the possibility that recommendations could come directly to us from outside sources. Right, exactly. Okay. I'm not saying that. Yep. I just want to make sure the superintendent's role is clear. So what is, what is it, how would you describe what you'd like for the superintendent to do independently? Um, uh, two things. I want, before it would come from an administrative head of the building, or the school site council, 
I would want it to have gone through the superintendent. I don't think a principal should have a discussion with his or her site council about a possible naming if the superintendent hasn't said, yes, that's a good idea. And, and I brought that up in our subcommittee meeting, and I forget, I brought up the exact same point, and you had an excellent answer to it. I forget what it was. Well, it's just that how do you, how, how do you see this working if at a, at a particular school, a parent group, a group of teachers come to the principal <laughs> and say, Kristen Bagley Jones has been retired now for five years, and we really think that the this the library should be named mm -hmm. after her. So, what happens then? The principal goes to Mary and says, "Do you think this is okay?" Mm -hmm. Before it's a public vote, before it's a public discussion, because what if the superintendent has a major issue with that person? You wouldn't want to have a public discussion about it. A principal. Well, would, would a principal other, go you, forward you, to a site council without on a matter of that when gravity this, without talking oh, to the superintendent first? Right. I, I would, would be a little surprised. Yeah, right. I would too, but it, but the question is whether you want to legislate that or said differently. It, so, what are the circumstances under which you you don't you want parent groups to feel like they have? the opportunity to make recommendations and the superintendent might say I don't think that's a good idea but should should we prevent the school site council from even considering that so what happens the school site council or some group of parents says we think you should do this and the principal then talks to Mary Mary says I don't think it's a good idea and the principal goes back and said no sorry it's not a good idea I'm not sure. Maybe there needs to be further discussion because I think you can open up a can of worms and if there's not a clear process for who can put forth the name. Parents can put forth the name. They don't work for us. Right. But if a principal goes ahead, and it could be a principal that would go ahead without talking about it with the superintendent, oh, that, that would well, be an issue. But yeah, then we'd have I, a I public agree. issue. I, I, but I, but I, I would... I think our leadership team is savvy enough that this one is they they would realize that that would this be one a, is, but it could be another potentially one. a career-ending move. But <laughs> but I mean, college campuses who do naming all the time. This is like a lockdown process, and there's a reason for it. You can't offend anyone. I, I can't. I, my just reading of this is I can't imagine um, something arising in in one of the schools that rose to the level of naming a building or part yep. of a building after someone where the principal involved wouldn't be running to the superintendent right. to talk about so it. So all first, I was asking is that we give move a heads up. I can't imagine it. All I was asking is that we move be recommended by the current superintendent of schools above receive the recommendation of the current administrative. It's always I, so I, that I didn't read see it. these as being ordered. It's That's not, it's right, not but I wrong. read it that way. And I'm clearly in the minority on this, but I read it as that you go to the administration and then you go to the superintendent. I'm saying, oh, let's do it the other That's way. That's an easy change. Yeah. That's all I'm asking is to just well, insert but, it but differently. Let's, we, no? were trying to, we were trying to track how a recommendation might occur. So if we move that up, I don't understand what is the superintendent recommending. The well, they must be recommended by the current superintendent of schools. Well, we've said that, but if you if you make that if the, these are in sequential order, so somebody in the case of a former employee, and then something must be recommended by the superintendent, and then you say it's considered at the local. Level? I don't know. I I just I don't want to go back and forth, but I just think this can be a fairly uh, involved process and I just want to be clear the superintendent reports to us and not the other folks so I just want to be clear she's in charge or he whoever is in there yeah, I think is that's in charge of this crystal clear but yep I can look at it whether I, we can make again it even if you have clearer. I I'd suggest at this point if you can think of a yep. suggested I was fixed, just saying to move it up to Leroy, I know Leroy. they're not in sequential order but if you move it up then you read that first and that makes me feel better. I also have a question about why do they have to be in for 25 years? Was that our suggestion or is that the uh, common one used, the employees? That, that seemed to be the, 
the standard, but it, that's entirely up to us. Could be 20 years, 15, 10. Right. I just, what if it's 20 years? What if it's 23? I, I don't know. Is there a standard for how many years that somebody should be an employee? The how many the years were Dr. Uh, Grass O'Neill and, I'm embarrassed to say, the weight room person? Right. The, Dr. Grass O'Neill, um, I believe, was 13 years, but 13 the, years. Um, Ridden, he perhaps Ridden. was 25 years. Okay. So right there we'd be out 50%, you know, Dr. Grass O'Neill, we couldn't have given namings to. Well, I think um, this is by its nature a process that's going to make um, people unhappy for the most part because we're going to be saying no more than we're saying yes. And we've got most, most things named that need to be named. So I don't think the number of opportunities we're talking about is very large unless we talk about renaming. Excuse me? <laughs> we're still checking our numbers over here. But what, what's your pleasure? So this is the first reading. Maybe, Christian, yeah. if you think of something that, you know, s specifically that you'd like to change. I mean, okay. you certainly can revisit this the next time you talk about I'll, it. I'll email you my thoughts. I think, too, that there's a, a, a statement in here, again, that the final decision was final and sole discretion, uh, final decision was sole discretion of the school committee. And right. I think that is enough to cover the exceptional circumstance, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Everyone else is just making recommendations. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. this is the vote here. You know, this is. Uh, yeah, I see guidance. differently, but I'm willing to concede and throw in my thoughts in an email. Okay. Um, wellness policy. So, wellness policy is uh, reflects only some changes related to those that were requested by Jackie Morgan uh, because of changes in the federal regulations. So those changes have been made, but other than that, this is the same policy you approved last year. And after some back and forth uh, about whether we might make edits, we decided that um, it was structured in a way that reflected uh, what the statutory requirements are, and we decided to leave it as is. Ms. Kelly. <clears throat> so, I, I'm a little um, confused as to what the statutory requirements are in terms of our policy and how detailed that policy needs to those, how detailed that needs to be. Well, we asked precisely that question, mm -hmm. and my understanding from Jackie and with some help from Kristen was that, that this policy was vetted in the Wellness Committee and that this policy as it's worded and the structure is what's required to meet those requirements. I didn't then say, well, so show me the requirements, but my understanding is it's structured this way because we said, well, this could be shorter, we could mm -hmm. take a few things out. They said, no, no, we went through that, it was vetted very carefully, and this is it. So declaring, I decided to declare victory and pull out. <laughs> Ms. Kelly. So we have it on uh, page three. Schools should facilitate students' participation in phys physical education for a minimum of 30 minutes per week. The classes should be of moderate to vigorous physical activity in accordance with national recommended guidelines. So it says should, but as we all know, at high school, you have phys ed for half a year, which I think is insane, but that's what we do. So um, I, I just, I wonder uh, whether the data that is listed here should be as specific as it is. Um, and I, I fear that, that it's sort of tying our hands. And, you know, I understand the reason for wanting um, schools to concentrate on health uh, and wellness for our kids. But I wonder if this policy is just not way too specific and would ask what the MASC template is for this policy. Well, first I'm heartened by how much we think alike because I asked exactly that question. I said, so doesn't this, so some of these things I'm not sure we're doing. And they said, but the policy requires that we say what we should be doing and that 
we should talk about that in some detail in each of the areas that are named on the front. So foods on campus, nutrition education, physical activity, and other school-based activities. And we should be detailed about what we're doing or should be doing in each of those areas. So if you like, I'm happy to ask the question once more, but I'm confident that at least according to our food services director and the wellness committee seem to be satisfied that this policy meets those requirements. So right. I, I guess the question is, does it meet or exceed? And so I believe it meets the requirements. Okay. Ms. Bagley John. Um, I was going to say, this has been a policy in the health and wellness and with the policy committee since uh, under Dr. Jafun, as I think Jackie said, it first came into effect. And it's from the federal government to say, if you get our food services, this is what you need to say you will do. And it is the first four issues on the front. My understanding from Jackie is that we do need to have all these details here. Correct. That's not up to us. And that's why it says things like should be designed, should ensure versus will. That's my understanding that we have to cover all these things, but we don't, we say should versus must. This is what we're Correct. aiming towards. But that's versus which is different from other policies we have. So it I don't know. Does different. this need to not be in the policy committee? And this is, this is a federally mandated thing to do. We don't have a choice. So does it not belong in policy? No, I think we have to do this to get our federal lunch mm -hmm. program. I think well, we have to do it, meaning we have to, the school committee must have a policy that uses the word should. Policies are musts. No, typically. not all the time. Well, it, it, in many, many instances they are. And this sounds to me more it's like it's um, administrative regulations, right. which is not our purview. And I guess that's why I'm asking the question. Right. So, again, I will ask that we refer to a MASC, who is our sort of mentoring body, to say, is this what other districts are writing, the detail right. that other districts are writing? And if they are, fine, I'm fine. But if they are not, then I would ask that we reconsider whether this truly belongs as school committee policy right. or an administrative regulation. Right. So do you want to vote and do that research for next year, or do you want to do that research for this year? Because I, I. So, so he, here's some of my problems. When we go into the Milton High School activities, right, has the following athletic teams. If we, for whatever reason, don't have a girls and boys ski team, are we violating our own policy? I and mean, these are the types of issues that, that right, you know, having this kind of detail, I think, create. And nice. I think that may have financial ramifications. So I would prefer, and granted, I don't think it has to be tomorrow, but that this kept, be kept on sort of the list of things to further research before we voted. But that would be my preference. Do we have a timeline um, when this needs to be voted for, uh, for, for the school launch? I, Ms. Bagley John. I believe it's um, for this upcoming school year, so it needs to be voted fairly soon. But we have a Health and Wellness Committee meeting Right. Friday morning. So let me bring it back to Jackie. And I mean, this has clearly been Jackie has been driving this bus by her job versus health and wellness has been driving it by policy. It's been driven by Jackie's job. So I'm thinking it's more of an administrative regulation and that maybe it's because it's called the wellness policy. Because I said, okay, we looked at it, but now it has to go to the policy subcommittee for them to vote on it. Mm -hmm. But if it's an administrative regulation that we have no choice over, that really isn't a policy. Right. So I can clarify that with Mary and John Friday morning. Absolutely. It, we can call it whatever we like. Right. But the point is, it, it reads like a policy. It does. So it? saying it's an administrative regulation, it, it, you can dress it up, but it's still a policy, and we're the policy makers of the <laughs> school's district. Right. So we had this discussion, but we can have it again. We had this, this same, the very same discussion about do we need this much detail? So you should take it up in the wellness committee. I'll contact MAs, ASC, but I'm, they're not the last word on this since there's a federal regulation involved. But we'll, uh, we'll gather whatever information we can and we'll be back next meeting. Okay. Anything else from? Policy subject. Well, that pretty much takes care of it. Okay. <laughs> and, and just we should add that anyone's welcome to join policy subcommittee that would like right. to. <laughs>
All right, uh, finance subcommittee, the April expenditure report, Ms. Kelly. Yes. Um, Mr. Gillis, I would ask if you might just give a brief overview of uh, what our finances are through the April report. Sure. Um, through April, the general fund is right about where it should be, with about 26% remaining for the last uh, two months of the year. May and June, we have lump sum payments for teachers that, that would be paid out. Um, a few adjustments to be made, as there always are in the last quarter, and, the, and those are noted um, in the footnotes on there. Uh, some, some, uh, some to salaries, some to uh, tuitions to, to the circuit breaker revolving fund. And just some reclassifications. Um, next page is grants, and we will spend down the special ed IDEA individuals with uh, Disabilities Education Act. We will have that spent down in in May, as we commonly do, and then the balance would be charged off to the uh, uh, general fund to pay for those aids for the rest of the year. Uh, next page would be the revolving funds. Uh, the revolving funds overall are in uh, fairly good health. Um, Anything that is uh, temporarily negative will be cleaned up uh, definitely before June 30, but oftentimes uh, in May uh, before that is done. Um, so no real, no real surprises or, or any changes there from where we've been in prior years or how we planned to go through this year. And the uh, April, uh, April ex uh, expense and uh, disbursements report for uh, the school lunch program, that, that program continues to operate um, pretty much as planned as well. Any questions on the April report? So I, I would ask that this be posted online and we um, we'll do that tomorrow. Yeah, that would be great. Um, and then the last is uh, we need a vote of the proposed fee schedule. That would be. Um, and uh, is it the committee's desire that we run through the individual changes or how would we like if to? You could probably make sure, just go through and highlight what the changes are just quickly. I think makes makes, makes the most sense. So there aren't too many changes. Um, preschool fee would change um, at, uh, at basically a rate of $25 a day for the integrated preschool program. And those funds go to offset uh, some of the staffing expense. The adult education, uh, slight changes to some of the courses, but not all of them. Uh, anywhere from 5 to $15 per course, uh, but not to exceed $195 um, for the most expensive course or be below $25 for the, for the cheapest course. Courses range anywhere from one time to, uh, you know, maybe a dozen meetings. Um, changes to the uh, rental agreement to park and recreation. Uh, looking to change the uh, custodial fee there and the rental fee. Change that to just one hour of, of custodial overtime during the week. Weekends and holidays would be actual labor. Um, and park and rec would uh, repair and maintain the field behind Pierce, which is something uh, our athletic program is needed is some more field space. Um, and we would have, you know, access to that after school, Monday through Friday for our practices and games. Um, the only other changes to the rental fees would be to actually lower the price for the Pierce Auditorium and increase the price for the high school auditorium. The two had been the same price, but one, one seats uh, about 750 people, the other one seats a little over 500. Um, and folks, when, when they would uh, get bumped or when the high school was, was booked and they wanted uh, the other one, they would continually ask for a, a discount because they couldn't have as many folks in. So after a couple of years of hearing the, hearing the requests, we'll now distance between the two of them. Uh, we also significantly rent out the high school auditorium a lot more than Pierce. Maybe now we'll, we'll rent out the Pierce a little bit more with a break in price. We also increased uh, the proposed increase to the price for the cafeteria. We've always treated it like the classroom. Classroom's about 900 square feet. The cafeterias could be 4,000 square feet, so the cafeterias got to be popular rentals, but they were a little bit more work and they were consuming a little bit more heat and electricity, so just to distance those. Um, and that's it. That's the summary of the changes. All the other things um, will remain 
uh, constant as most of the fees have been increased in fiscals, uh, fiscal years 10 or 11 or 12 with only a couple um, that haven't been increased uh, since FY08. So, Ms. Kelly, are you, uh, I'll entertain a motion from the Finance Subcommittee to approve the fee schedule for fiscal 13? Correct. Is there a, is there a second? Second. Yes, Ms. Gregory Jones. I'm not voting uh, against it, and this is great, and thank you for the outlining these changes. I do just want to go on the record to say transportation costs, high school athletics, and the club costs, and the Pierce student activities, maybe not the Pierce student activities as much because it's 75, but, you know, again, they're just, they're high, and they're hard on families, and I just want to acknowledge that. There's nothing we can do about it. It has to stay the way that it is, but it is high. And uh, I wish there was a way that we could change it, but I know that we can't. Families, so I just want to put that out there. But I know yes. you all agree with me, but I just needed to say it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for saying that, Ms. Baby Jones. Thank you. Um, so the school lunch is in increasing by 25 cents. That wasn't highlighted, but it is a change on this on this form. And I just want to say that it's worth noting that the last increase was in 2008. Right. The um, the, the reason why it wasn't uh, highlighted on this form is because that was voted back in the fall. Oh, okay. That change for fiscal 13. We were having an, an audit, um, and, and in order to comply with the uh, new federal regulations, uh, part of it was requiring uh, systems to get their lunch prices up to whatever the free and reduced lunch rate is, the which currently rate. it's like $2.42 and our price of lunch was cheaper than what we got reimbursed. So the federal government wants everybody to work towards getting up to whatever the rate is. And um, so we chose to, to have that vote early and, and comply be in compliance with the law before we got audited so that they wouldn't remind us as a finding to do it so I do just want to add that you know not having an increase in four years and still only paying two dollars for the caliber of the food that we're getting or varied prices depending on the height of the level of the school is amazing um, and just very quickly on the park and rec is this so it's going to zero and I understand that and I'm excited about the changes in the Pierce field is this a one-year commitment, or where do we stand with this next year? Will we we renegotiate, look at it again? We we are uh, still completing the final negotiations in terms of what it means to have uh, the park and rec facilitate the resurfacing of the field to Pierce. Uh, we did leave the fee structure open, uh, as we always have in the past. Uh, so we continue to work with that town department as we always have. Great. Mm. Technically, we're only voting this for fiscal 13. Right. We, we, we would re, re revisit everything next year uh, in any case. Thank you. Any other questions, comments on the fee proposal? Hearing none, all those in favor? That is unanimous with Mr. Uh, Walker having recused himself, Maura. Okay. Um, anything else from finance? That's it. Thank you. Uh, any other citizen speak responses from prior meetings? Next meeting agenda items. Well, we've heard a couple of those already. <laughs> 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 and so, uh, citizen speak. No, we've outlasted the citizens. So, <laughs> I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>